So our text for God's Word this morning is Exodus 9, verse 8 to 12, and let's give it attention now to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired Word. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses threw it in the air. And it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. So the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. This is God's holy word. May he bless our hearts now this morning. Well, with the previous plagues, I have opened with uh, stories of my own experiences with frogs and mosquitoes and flies. But I've never experienced a case of severe boils. So I don't have any personal stories about boils to share with you, and I'm sure you're all grateful for that. Uh, but this... Uh, plague isn't simply about boils, Uh, it's about serious sickness and life-threatening disease more generally, as we'll see. And in the sixth plague, we'll see once again God's glory and power over creation, over all false gods, and over all his enemies as he justly judges them. And we'll see once again his mercy and salvation for his people. So let's... uh, Consider that the sixth plague that boils upon Egypt. And we'll see three things here. First, Egypt is feeling the heat. And secondly, the idols of Egypt are humiliated once again. And third, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. So first, we see that Egypt is feeling the heat. Uh, We see in this sixth plague that boils break out on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And to begin with, we might ask, what specifically is this? plague of boils. And scholars have had several theories. Some have argued that it was anthrax, an infectious and usually fatal disease. It's characterized by malignant pustules, elevated blisters or boils. Others have argued that it was uh, smallpox. Still others have argued that it was leprosy, as much of the vocabulary here is used elsewhere in the Old Testament of leprosy and its consequences. Whatever it specifically was, it was miserable. All man and beast in Egypt, in other words, all the people and animals in Egypt have contracted a skin disease that is extremely unpleasant and life-threatening. The Bible describes inflamed areas of skin, festering boils that broke out into blistering sores. The same element is described in Deuteronomy 28, where Moses warns the Israelites what would happen to them if they failed as a nation to keep God's holy law in the holy land of Canaan. And we read there in Deuteronomy 28 that if they are disobedient, the Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. So it was painful. This painful skin disease of some kind. Children, a boil is like a, almost like a bubble on your skin. Maybe you've gotten a blister uh, when you wear shoes and run around in the summertime and uh, or flip-flops and you see these little blisters on your feet. A boil is kind of like that, only bigger and on other parts of your body. And when it pops, it hurts. It's painful. And so Egypt is feeling the heat here as God turns up the heat on them in this sixth plague. And remember, the, the plagues increase in their intensity as you go from plague one to ten. And no doubt, each plague was miserable, as we've seen. But up until this point, you know, they've had to deal with pesky frogs and insects and the death of their livestock. But this plague gets much more personal and painful as it brings about this great pain on their 
own personal bodies from head to toe. Isn't it the case that physical pain and suffering has a way of getting someone's attention in a way that nothing else can? It's one thing if there's all kinds of evil and suffering out there going on, but it's another thing when it's your own body and you feel as though your body's betrayed you and you're suffering miserably in your body. And this plague shows that the God of Israel has power over their bodies. And it warned Egypt that their very lives were in danger. And again, as we've seen with all the plagues, this is a supernatural occurrence. Again, some have tried to explain away the plagues as simply natural occurrences. And they say that this would have been a disease that was spread by the flies from the fourth plague, that picked up the disease from all the dead carcasses of the livestock in the fifth plague, and then passed it on by biting both man and beast in the sixth plague. And while that's an interesting theory, it's highly speculative and goes against the Bible's clear explanation of the plagues as signs and wonders that Yahweh, the Lord, performed. It says that the Lord sent these plagues in Psalm 78 and elsewhere. And we see the miraculous nature of this plague in its onset as it came unannounced without warning for Egypt. And as soon as Moses and Aaron did exactly what the Lord said, so we see its miraculous nature in that way, and, and we also see its miraculous nature in its method, in that the soot from the kiln was transubstantiated. Yeah, we can actually use that word. <laughs> Just not the Lord's Supper. But uh, the soot from the kiln was transubstantiated by God into fine dust over all the land of Egypt. And then it was miraculous that God used that dust to break out in boils on the Egyptians and only the Egyptians as verse 11 implies and as we've seen in the previous place where God makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel and so we see here that Egypt was plagued but Israel was protected so again we see God's infinite power over creation in these ten plagues and let us praise him for his power Praise God for his infinite power over his creation. He is sovereign over this world. He's sovereign over this world. And the good news is that he's not just almighty God, but he's your heavenly father for the sake of Christ. Think of the children's song, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And that's our father in heaven. So rejoice that your Father in heaven has such power and authority over creation that he's a good Father who will use all that power to bring about your ultimate good in Christ. And so while God's people are safe under the mighty arms of the Lord, Egypt is feeling the heat. And not only in their bodies, but also in their souls. How so? Well, they're also feeling the heat of God's just judgment because of their sins. We see this in that the Lord tells Moses and Aaron to take handfuls of soot from the kiln to throw it into the air, and then the Lord miraculously transforms it into fine dust and uses it to cause boils on all of Egypt. Children, do you know what soot is? Soot is, you know, when you burn something, when you have a fire, like a campfire, and all the wood burns down, and then it's just ashes. Soot is ashes. And so God tells Moses and Aaron to take ashes, to take soot from the kiln uh, to perform this miracle. We might ask, why even use soot from the kiln? Why not just speak the word? Why does God just say the word and boils break off on all the Egyptians? What is the Lord teaching Egypt with this sign of soot from the kiln? Well, as we've seen time and time again, God never uses arbitrary signs. He always has a good design, a purpose behind it all. And it's helpful to know that the magicians in Egypt, they were not only sorcerers who uh, worshipped idols and drew upon demonic 
power. They were also closely associated with medicine and, and, uh, and they would have offered sacrifices to their gods to atone them when they're, when they're sick. And, and one of the things they would have done is taken the, the ashes from their sacrifices and, and thrown them up in the air as a sign of blessing. And so God takes this very sign of blessing and turns it into a sign of curse upon the Egyptians. And not only that, but this is poetic justice. This is poetic justice. Remember that Egypt oppressed God's people and made them make bricks in the kilns of Egypt. We opened this book of the Bible, Exodus 1, and we read, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field and all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And things got even worse for Israel, as we saw in Exodus 5, when the Pharaoh took away their supply of straw. And said, now you've got to gather your own straw, and I still want the same amount of, of bricks, the same daily quota. Just think of the pain and agony of that, all the suffering. Think of all the people who died in those fiery furnaces in Egypt. Because they, their bodies couldn't take it anymore. There was no mercy for them. One thinks of the Jews in Nazi Germany. Auschwitz and those sorts of things. And so for God to use soot from the kilns of Egypt as the means through which he brings boils upon the Egyptians would have been a powerful sign that God is just and will repay the wicked for their sins. It would have been a powerful sign to God's people that no matter what persecution they go through as his people, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Let this sign be a warning to all today who reject God and persecute his people. God will not let that go unpunished, but will justly judge all of his and our enemies in his eternal wrath when Christ returns. And so when we today are mocked and ridiculed and persecuted for our faith, let us not seek revenge. Let us rather pray for those who persecute us and love our enemies as our Lord taught us. And let us entrust ourselves to him who judges justly in the end. Vengeance is mine, I will repeat, says the Lord. And you see that here. And thanks be to God that, that Christ took the just judgment that we deserve because of our sins. When our sins were placed upon him on the cross. We must never forget that Jesus took God's just vengeance upon himself on the cross in our place. And for all who trust in him alone for salvation. So even as we entrust ourselves to the justice of God and know that he will one day repay, we, we praise him for that, but we also are humble in our praise because he has delivered us from the judgment we deserve through the precious blood of his son. So we see here in the first place that Egypt is feeling the heat. And secondly, notice that the idols of Egypt are once again humiliated. Numbers 33, 4 says, On their gods also the Lord executed judgments. And so while Egypt is feeling the heat, once again, the deeper significance we see here is that Pharaoh's gods were humiliated and humbled to nothing. They're exposed as counterfeit deities that cannot provide protection from sickness and disease and cannot heal when it comes. And the Egyptians were well known for their interest in medicine and looked to their gods for healing. Many worshipped Amun-Ra, who was believed to be the king of the gods and their creator god. And one ancient text describes him as he who dissolves evils and dispels ailments, a physician who heals. Another one of their gods was Thoth, who was the god of healing arts. And there were others we could mention, but the most common Egyptian god for dealing with disease was Sekhmet. One scholar explains that the Egyptians were constantly aware of the possibility of infectious diseases and sores. This reflected in the fact that Sekhmet, a lion-headed goddess, was supposed to have had the power of both creating epidemics and bringing them to an end. A special priest who was devoted to her called Sunu 
amulets and other objects were employed by the Egyptians to ward off evil in their lives and by that sickness in their lives. And so in the sixth plague of boils on all the people and animals in Egypt, we see that, uh, that Amon Ra and Thoth and Sekhmet and all the rest of Egypt's gods are judged and once again is powerless to protect them from disease and powerless to heal. In other words, they're utterly humiliated, exposed as nothing. Yahweh, the God of Israel alone, is the only one who ultimately can send disease, protect from disease, and heal from disease. And one by one, God is attacking the Egyptian gods in their supposed area of expertise. This is why there's ten plagues. He's, he's lining them all up, all these idols, with their area of expertise and showing them to be nothing and smashing the idols of Egypt. Right? If you just smash one, maybe they think, oh, okay, maybe not that one, but these other ones over here. But no, he takes them all, exposes them as nothing. He's revealing his glory and his power as the one Lord and God over all the nations and over all creation. And while we may not worship Amon Ra and Thoth and Sekhmet today in Canada in 2022, these counterfeit gods are still with us today, as we've been seeing with these plagues. We too are tempted to worship these false gods in our day and age. We live in an age of remarkable progress in medicine and medical technology. We have x-rays, we have MRIs and CAT scans, we have cold and flu medicine, antibiotics, vaccines and anesthesia to take away pain. We have prosthetic body parts, we have reading glasses, contact lenses and LASIK eye surgery. The list could go on and on. And who knows what else will come about through medical research. In the words of Phil Riken, he writes, as a result of our advanced knowledge of the body and its various ailments, it is tempting to make medicine an object of faith. Most patients go to the hospital believing they will be cured. However, it doesn't always work out that way. Doctors and nurses sometimes make mistakes. They don't always make the right diagnosis or prescribe the right treatment. Besides, there is still no cure for death. So medicine has its limits. This is true not only of clinical medicine, but also of alternative medicine, which uses the healing properties of vitamins and other naturally occurring substances. Despite all our skill at healing, we are not sovereign over the human body. This means that medical expertise must never become our source of ultimate confidence for physical well-being. Medicine makes a wonderful tool, but a poor deity. Whenever we get a prescription filled or going for surgery or start chemotherapy, we should remember that all healing comes from God and that Christ alone is Lord of the body. And so we give thanks for our day and age of medical technology advancement. We're thankful for our vitamins. We're thankful for all that we know about the body today. Thank God and praise Him for that. But don't worship it. Don't put all your ultimate trust and hope in medicine, God alone is Lord of the body. And he alone can send disease and heal from disease. And he does it. He can do it either through a miracle or through medicine. And we praise him for that. And so put not your trust ultimately in the idols of health and wellness and healing in our day and age. But be thankful for those things and worship God ultimately. And recognize, as, as Reichen mentions there, that, that you all will die one day. Your only hope beyond the grave is Jesus Christ, who lived a perfectly righteous life and died on the cross for all of your sins. And he was risen from the dead bodily as the first fruits of our bodily resurrection on the last day. We, we sing in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. We sing that, and we sing Psalm 91, who protect us from disease, and then we get disease in this life. What are we to do with those verses? We look to the return of Christ. He will raise us from the dead body and give us new bodies 
and heal us from all of our diseases, ultimately on the last day. And not only are the idols of Egypt humiliated, but also the magicians are humiliated. They can't perform their duties as priests here because they are ritually unclean because of the boils all over their bodies. And they cannot even stand, notice it says, they cannot even stand before Moses because of the boils, as we read in verse 11. And notice the contrast here in our passage. They can't stand in Moses' presence, but we read in verse 10 that Moses and Aaron are indeed able to stand before Pharaoh. The magicians can't stand, you see, in the presence of the Lord's prophet. Not only because of their physical pain and suffering, but this is also a sign of their guilt and shame. It makes us think of Psalm 1, which says that the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And there is coming a day when God will bring about the final judgment when Christ returns. And as we mentioned before, that the book of Revelation speaks of the final judgment in terms of the plagues. Only they're coming upon the whole world one day. So Revelation 16 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. You see, the day is coming when everyone who has rejected Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, will be plagued with the painful sores of God's wrath forever and ever. And those who come under God's just wrath on that day will not be able to stand before God in their own merits, in their own goodness, in their own righteousness. They will be naked and ashamed in the guilt of their sins and cast into the eternal lake of fire so again, seek refuge in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ alone, and you will be saved through the judgment. We see salvation through judgment pictured here once again with Israel, who is spared from the painful sores of God's wrath in the sixth plague. And that's not because of their merits. It's not because of their inherent righteousness in them, but because God has graciously chosen them to redeem them as his people mercy and grace. And uh, although they were spared here, they would not be spared later as God's wrath came upon them as a nation for their idolatry in the holy land of Canaan. And God exiled them because of it. The curses of the law fell upon them. So too, we deserve the curse of the law, but thanks be to God that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us as it is written. Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. And so we see here that Egypt is feeling the heat and that the idols of Egypt are humiliated. And third, then, we see that Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Sadly, we read once again that even after painful boils on all of Egypt, including the Pharaoh, this plague ends the same way all the other plagues end that have come before, with the Pharaoh's heart hardened. Well, this time it's said a little differently. Up to this point in the plague cycles, we've heard that the Pharaoh hardened his heart or that his heart was hardened. But this is the first time that it says, the Lord, Yahweh, hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And so here we're confronted with the mystery of divine sovereignty on the one hand and human responsibility on the other hand. Because both of these statements are true and both are affirmed in the Bible. That Pharaoh hardened his own heart and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The Bible also affirms that God sovereignly ordains all things that come to pass in some sense and, and, that, God, and that man is responsible for all of his sin, for all of his evil actions. And that's a truth that we admittedly cannot fully understand with our finite minds, but we have to trust God's word. We have to trust that God has a good purpose behind the evil he allows to happen in this world. 
And we might not always know that good purpose in this life, but we will in the age to come when Christ returns. Until then, we trust that God is good and sovereign, and man is responsible for his evil actions. And we see that supremely in the cross of Jesus Christ. Those who crucified the Lord of glory meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That he might glorify his name and save his people from their sins forever and bring them into eternal fellowship with him. And God had a good purpose for raising up Pharaoh. And at the same time, Pharaoh was responsible for his own wickedness and hardening his own heart. Paul puts it this way in Romans 9. He says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Because that's, the, that's our natural instinct, right? That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. And Paul anticipates that in Romans 9. He says, by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, Paul writes, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Or who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared before him? For glory. See, God does all things ultimately for his glory and according to his own good purposes. And who are we to charge God with injustice, Paul says? God is just and good, and all his ways are just and good, whether we fully understand it or not. And he is free to have mercy upon whom he will, and have mercy upon whom he will, not on that, but pardon whom he wills. He alone is creator, he alone is sovereign. He alone is God, and he is able to ordain all things in such a way that man is still responsible for his own willful rebellion. He's able to do that. He's almighty God. He's able to ordain all things in such a way that man is still responsible for his own willful rebellion. And the good purpose to which God raised a Pharaoh, Paul says, was so that he might demonstrate his glory and his power and we see that over and over again, don't we, in these plagues. We see God's power and glory in a marvelous way over creation, over all rulers, over all false gods, over the devil and the demons, indeed over all his enemies. And we see in a marvelous way how God demonstrates his mercy to his people. And if you know his mercy this day, if you know his mercy towards you in Christ and are trusting in that then praise God that he has shown mercy to you. Praise God that he has softened your heart. As Michael Horton puts it, God is not active in hardening hearts in the same way that he's active in softening hearts. Scripture does speak of God hardening hearts, yet it also speaks of sinners hardening their own hearts. However, no passage speaks of sinners softening their own hearts and regenerating themselves. Human beings are alone responsible for their hardness of heart, but God alone softens and in fact recreates the hearts of his elect. In short, God only has to leave us to our own devices in the case of reprobation, but it requires the greatest works of the triune God to save the elect, including the death of the Father's only begotten Son. So if you know his mercy and grace, praise God. Be thankful, be humble, and worship God for his power and glory and mercy and all his attributes. As we see them magnified in these plagues, and even more as we see God's glory and power and mercy magnified in the cross of Jesus Christ. 
and in his resurrection from the dead. And so Pharaoh's heart was hardened as he suffered this painful plague of boils, and he does not listen to Moses and still does not let God's people go. But how then shall we respond when we experience serious sickness in this life? Let us not be like the Pharaoh and harden our hearts. Rather, let us turn to God in prayer and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, for he cares for us. He cares for you in Christ. And as you perhaps suffer with serious sickness now, at this moment or in the future, let me encourage you with a few words in closing and how to respond to serious sickness in this life. First, let me encourage you to trust that it's not the curse of God upon you. It's not the curse of God upon you. If you are in Christ through faith, then Christ already redeemed you from the curse of the law. As 1 Peter 2 puts it, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds you have been healed. So rest in that promise when you are sick and know for sure that you're not under the curse of the law. Now that said, God does discipline his children in love. He does at times allow us to go through serious sickness for the, the good purpose of waking us up to some sin in our life so that we might repent of it and turn from it and continue to walk in his good ways for our eternal well-being. But it's never to be understood as his avenging wrath and the curse of the law upon us. And while it may be his loving discipline for some sin in our life, that's not always the case. We should never just immediately conclude that. And you know who's a good example of that? Job. He got boils just like the Egyptians did. And yet it says he was blameless and upright and feared God. But either way, if God allows serious sickness to come into your life, walk by faith that God has redeemed you from the curse of the law in Christ and walk by faith that God will use it for your ultimate good. And know that nothing will be wasted in God's providence. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You may not know why in this life, but trust in God's promise to work all things together for your ultimate good. For those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, as Romans 8 promises us. And even so, it's okay to lament and to cry out to God for mercy, as we see with all the wonderful lament psalms, to be honest and real in our struggles with sickness. Let me encourage you to not only lament, but also to pray to God for healing, whether it be through a miracle or through medicine. And praise God and thank Him if and when you are healed. And even if that doesn't happen in this life, as we said a moment ago, know that it will happen in the resurrection of your body on the last day when Christ returns. And so walk in hope that you'll one day have a new body like the glorious body of Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead no longer subject to disease or death. And we see this beautifully pictured in the gospel accounts, don't we? And all the wonderful miracles of healing that Jesus performs. That's a picture of your permanent healing when Christ returns. So that's in part how we ought to live as Christians when we experience serious sickness in this life. And surely we could say a lot more. But a good illustration of this is in Blaise Pascal. Pascal was a French philosopher and theologian who lived from 1623 to 1662. And he suffered with serious health issues throughout his life, and he died at the age of 39. And by God's grace, he persevered in prayer and patient trust in God. And he wrote a prayer called The Right Use of Serious Illness. And here's part of how that prayer went. He prayed, O Lord, whose spirit is so good and gracious in all things, and who is so merciful that not only the prosperities, but also the distresses which happen to your elect are the effects of your mercy. Grant me grace not to act like a heathen in the state to which your justice has brought me, 
but that like a true Christian, I may acknowledge you for my Father and my God in whatever, whatsoever circumstances I am placed. Grant me grace, O Lord, to join your consolations to my sufferings, that I may suffer like a Christian. I pray not to be exempted from pain, but I pray that I may not be abandoned to the pains of nature without the comforts of your spirit. Grant, O Lord, that I may conform myself to your will, and that being sick as I now am, I may glorify you in my sufferings. Unite me to yourself, Fill me yourself and with your Holy Spirit, so that being filled by you, it may be no longer I who live or suffer, but you, O my Savior, who lives and suffers in me, that having thus been a small partaker of your sufferings, you may fill me completely with glory. Amen. Beloved, may we walk by faith and walk in hope and pray like that as we endure serious sickness in this life and all kinds of sufferings. Let us trust that our Heavenly Father loves us and nothing will ever separate us from His love for us in Christ. And let us look forward to Christ's return and the glories of the new heavens and new earth. For glorious things await us there as we hear at the end of the book of Revelation. And rest in this promise and conclusion that He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for such sweet consolations of your word, the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you would help us in all of our struggles in the Christian life, especially as we perhaps struggle with serious sickness. We pray that you would help us to persevere by the immeasurable greatness of your power, the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead and now dwells within us. Help us to know your strength. Help us to know your love and faithfulness to us in Christ who loved us and gave himself for us on the cross to redeem us from the curse of the law. We thank you for that. And we pray you'd help us to walk in faith and hope and love and help us to share the hope within us with others who are suffering in this world, and help us to look forward to the return of Christ. We pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.